Okay. And uh, so let's start the webinar. Uh, so this is one of our first webinars. Uh, Dr. Santosh Venkatachalam, a consultant orthopedic surgeon from UK, has agreed to do our first webinar. And he's a FRCS trainer. He comes for a lot of the FRCS exams. So you can listen to the first talk by Dr. Santosh, and he's going to talk on his approach to a stiff shoulder. Okay, Santosh, over to you. Okay, hello all. Um, as uh, Hitesh mentioned, I'm, I am a practicing upper limb orthopedic consultant with interest in trauma as well. So I'm also an FRCS orthopedic examiner in the UK. So what I thought was instead of covering a condition, we will cover a case scenario that you're likely to encounter very commonly in the upper limb sections of whichever exams you take part anywhere in the world. Um, so this, is, this could be used for a long case or what we call as an intermediate case in the UK and also for short cases where you're just expected to examine a patient with very minimal history. So the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'll try and cover what might be used as a, an approach to reach a diagnosis and have a discussion that can get you a pass or a higher score than that. So as I said before, I, I am an FRCS examiner, but I do not want any of you to think if I do this, I will definitely pass. These are my perspectives as an examiner. This is how I would look at somebody examining a patient or taking history from a patient. And these things are methodologies that you develop as you go on. So this is what I do. It may not be always right, or it may not be the best way for you. And this can change with time as well. So one year down the line, you, I do not think you should be able to code this presentation and say, right, this is what was taught. So this is what I did and still I failed. So I do not want those kind of discussions on this. So the idea is to give you some signposts or directions as to how you can approach a patient with a stiff shoulder. So we're starting with a clinical scenario, uh, like an exam where you're seeing a patient and the examiner tells you, uh, talk to this patient about his shoulder and it, or the presenting complaint from the doctor says, he's got a very stiff shoulder and he's come to you to the clinic and go ahead and start examining. Okay. So uh, the textbooks, what we tend to notice is that they are all in boxes. They come in as saying, okay, if as it demonstrated in the picture, when you have a weather device like that, that tells you that if the stone is wet, it's raining. If the stone is dry, it's not raining. If it's swinging up and down, it's windy. Or if the stone is gone, it's a tornado. Uh, so that's how textbooks tend to box these conditions, okay? So in general, the different boxes that you can think about in a shoulder would be a stiff shoulder, a shoulder that does not move very well. Then you have a weak shoulder. On certain positions of the shoulder, it doesn't feel right. It's more a symptom than a sign. Uh, again, instability could be where they, they present with problems in certain positions of the shoulder. And uh, painful shoulder. On certain movements, it's painful. Okay, these are the conditions we talk about. One is a stiff shoulder. One is an unstable shoulder. One is a weak shoulder because problems with the nerves or the tendons that move your shoulder, the rotator cuff or the brachial plexus. And then you have a painful shoulder, which could be like a painful R, rotator cuff related pathologies. Okay. So that is the ideal situation. What you see in textbooks, they come under these four categories. But real life, they're never individual. They never come in boxes. Patients don't read conditions. Patients don't read textbooks. The conditions don't read textbooks to present in a classical way. So there's always a degree of overlap between these conditions. So you can have a stiff shoulder that feels a bit weak or it can feel a bit unstable and can feel like there is a painful uh, impingement or depending on the stage of the condition, it can be a bit painful as well. So as clinicians, our role is to identify what is the predominant problem or what is the predominant problem that started off the whole process and what are the secondary symptoms and how we deal or get to the bottom of or diagnosis of the condition and how we manage it further. And that is what is expected as a practicing orthopedic consultant or a surgeon once you've finished your exam. So that is what is being assessed. How you're able to kind of thread out the nuances of what the actual condition is. So in the next few slides, we will talk about how to deal with a stiff shoulder 
and how we can get to the bottom of where the problem is. And there are useful hints like basic medical school, history taking examination and investigation. So the challenge with shoulders is it's not that easy to make a clinical diagnosis just based on history and examination. They can aid in the diagnosis, but it cannot be the whole and soul. The trouble being, if you look at literature or if you look at a textbook that describes different tests in the shoulder, there's more than 300 or 350 tests described to diagnose a shoulder problem. And that just suggests that there are so many tests None of them are very sensitive or very specific, okay? So you have the challenge of identifying or a test that works best for you and that can kind of lead you towards the diagnosis. And none of these tests can be 100% accurate. So you cannot say, I will do just this and it will be fine. And the other problem is the fact that the patient can have pain on certain movements and you do not know whether the test is positive because of the actual weakness in the muscle or the tendon or whether it's due to pain inhibition as well. So you have to kind of tailor your tests based on what you think is suitable for that patient. And uh, I have a method uh, on how I examine shoulders, but as I said, you will have to develop your own methodology as to how you go about sequentially, and at the same time demonstrating to the other person who's the examiner standing on the other side to say why you're doing this test, what you're looking for, and what you're looking for. There is no point doing a test and not knowing what it means at the end of it. So you will need to have an idea as to how you're going to go about examining a patient with a shoulder problem. Um, there is a link on the screen there. It, just, uh, it was mainly meant for the general practitioners in the UK, but it is applicable to orthopedic practice as well because it will give you a rough idea as to how you can reasonably assess a shoulder within pain limits and within time constraints especially when, in, when you're under stress, you don't want to be doing seven tests to demonstrate if the supraspinatus is weak or not. So uh, this is the method I use. You're more than welcome to go on, click on that link at some stage after the talk if you want to have a look at it. And if it matches with what you practice, maybe use it or improvise it to your own um, use, really. That's what I would say. I'm not prescriptive about the method of examination. As long as you're able to demonstrate what test you're doing, why you're doing, and what the result of the test is after the examination is, that is fine. It doesn't really matter how you get to it. There are many ways to skin a cat. Um, I find this is a very useful table uh, in dealing with a problem in the shoulder. Generally, I think about whether the shoulder is predominantly stiff, whether it's unstable, or whether it comes under the painful arc or pain on elevation kind of a shoulder. So what we need to look at is if it's a predominantly stiff shoulder, which is what we are focusing in this talk, is movements being restricted. The classical one is lack of external rotation. Um, it is the classical problem is a frozen shoulder in a middle-aged patient, but in the clinical setting, when you're actually seeing them, uh, you have to think about what could be the other causes. You don't want to miss out any red flags. You don't want to miss out things like tumor. It could be arthritis could be a vascular necrosis, it could be various other reasons. So an x-ray will give you an idea as to what the predominant problem is. If it's an unstable problem, uh, unstable shoulder, as I mentioned before, patients usually have a history of trauma. They are on the younger side. If you have two younger person who presents with no history of trauma and bilateral shoulder instability, you're thinking of systemic causes like uh, ligamentous laxity and so on. But if it's a young patient with trauma, has symptom of instability where the shoulder doesn't feel right on certain positions like abduction and external rotation, you're thinking of an unstable shoulder there. And then you come across the pain on elevation shoulder. Certain movements are painful, could be related to a myriad of pathologies. There could be subacromial impingement, rotator cuff partial tears, uh, and so on and so forth. And it'll be quite challenging to differentiate where exactly the problem is uh, in those kind of situations. But at least you have three categories in general that says the predominant symptom is stiffness, the predominant symptom is instability, or whether it's related to a rotator cuff pathology. But our focus is on a stiff shoulder, a patient who presents to you or who is in front of you in the exams with a stiff shoulder that's restricted on movements. Okay. And it, it could be, the stiff shoulder could be related to a primary rotator cuff pathology as well. It could be a secondary frozen shoulder sometimes. 
And in those situations, it may be difficult to establish all your tests of whether the cuff is intact, whether the patient has subacromial impingement, whether there is uh, ACJ arthritis due to cross adduction being positive, because in a stiff shoulder, the movements are not there for you to assess these kind of that range of uh, movements in the shoulder for you to diagnose a problem with the rotator cuff confidently. So you need to be aware of that as well. So moving on, as I said before, the purpose of this talk is to see how you can approach a patient with a stiff shoulder. Uh, we are talking about somebody who's got a shoulder that doesn't move very well. So we need to establish what is the likely pathology here and how we are going to manage the patient further. So in general, it, again, it is not a rule of the thumb, but if you look at the age of the patient, that will kind of lead you to where the primary pathology is likely to be. If you have a young patient who has had a history of trauma, or you could have a middle-aged patient, uh, no trauma, gradual onset, and then the pain becomes worse as time goes on, they're not able to manage their activities of daily living, they could have a history of diabetes, and then you have the elderly patient who is in their late 60s or about, uh, again, gradual onset, no major trauma, the pain is there all the time, it's aching, it keeps them awake at night, they're not able to manage their activities of daily living, they can hear some creaking sound in their shoulder. Immediately, the minute you see the patient or know the age of the patient, you can think of these kind of possibilities as to what this is likely to be, okay? Then, Apart from the regular history taking, you move on to the examination. If it is something like a, a locked posterior dislocation or a missed posterior dislocation, a contour change compared to an anterior dislocation may not be that obvious. So you could be caught out in an exam situation, especially when you're under stress examining these patients and trying to demonstrate what you're looking at. But generally, you should be able to say that they're not able to externally rotate their arm. Um, if it's a locked posterior dislocation and the the patient is a thin body habitus. Sometimes you can feel the dislocated posterior head. The contour may be slightly different. Look for the axillary nerve like in any condition that you do when you examine a shoulder. If it's a middle-aged patient, depending on the stage of the frozen shoulder, which is the likely diagnosis in a middle-aged patient, you look at conditions where, where situate, examine them, depending if the cuff is intact, if it is primary or a secondary frozen shoulder. And classically, they have restricted external rotation. That's the main movement that is restricted. Um, if it's elderly, generally the osteoarthritis is the primary cause in that situation. You would be very reluctant to diagnose a frozen shoulder in an elderly patient. It is either arthritis or something more nasty going on, either it's tumor or infection and conditions like myeloma. So you need to be wary of it. I'd be very, very reluctant to diagnose a frozen shoulder in extremes of age. Too young, think of some other cause like instability. Too old, think of some other cause like tumor, arthritis, or uh, infection, okay? So in general, elderly patients, they'll have restricted movements in all directions. They'll, have demonst they'll demonstrate classical features of arthritis of the shoulder, with crepitus in the shoulder. And the first investigation you would do uh, or would ask for when a patient presents to you with a problem like this is a, an X-ray of the shoulder. That will usually demonstrate uh, the pathology, either arthritis or a dislocated shoulder. If it's a completely normal x-ray in a middle-aged patient, then you can reasonably confidently say that it's likely to be a frozen shoulder because in a frozen shoulder, you will not have any prop, uh, pathology on the x-ray. Sometimes you can identify things like ACG arthritis or calcific tendonitis that could have led on to uh, a stiff shoulder. So as mentioned before, the key thing would be a radiograph of the shoulder, look for uh, insist on getting an axillary view, especially in a young patient, because it's almost, literature suggests almost 50 to 80% of the shoulder dislocations, the posterior shoulder dislocations that are missed are based on an anterior posterior radiograph or an AP radiograph of the shoulder. So it's very easy to overlook where you're not looking for it properly and you miss the bulb sign, light bulb sign and so on and so forth. But an axillary view will give you the answer whether the humeral head is facing the clenoid or it's dislocated posteriorly and if there's a reverse hill sac. If it's a normal x-ray, as I said, in a middle-aged patient, you can confidently think of frozen shoulder. Elderly patients, they will demonstrate features of glenohumeral arthritis or cuff tear arthritis and so on and so forth. But also look for any other red flags, if there's any lytic lesion there or any, anything else to suggest 
a secondary cause of lack of movement in the shoulder, like tumors. Okay. If the x-rays are normal and you're still not sure whether it's primary or secondary frozen shoulder in a middle-aged patient, then you're thinking of imaging the soft tissues. If you're thinking it's predominantly the rotator cuff, you could either get an ultrasound or MRI, depending on whatever you think is the primary pathology. If you're thinking it's a cuff tear and you want to know the degree of fatty infiltration, degree of retraction, and uh, the muscle atrophy and so on and so forth, and you're not very confident with your radiologist or radiographer who's doing the ultrasound, an MRI might be a better option to suggest whether the cuff tear is repairable or not and what you need to do next. So in general, frozen shoulder management, we all pretty much are aware. Uh, you can go through the ladder of management. It's a self-limiting condition, depending on the stage of the disease. If pain is a predominant problem, you can try things like steroid injections, physiotherapy, painkillers. Um, and this can all be interchangeable. It doesn't have to be in the same order, okay? And we tend to use what in the UK off late, there is evidence to suggest an ultrasound guided hydrodilatation or an X-ray guided hydrodilatation of the capsule with steroid and high volume, low dose local anesthetic can help. Um, that's one of the options we tend to use, um, but otherwise you, you still have the manipulation under anesthesia and an arthroscopic capsular release. And for an arthritic shoulder, pretty much similar. Uh, you try injections, painkillers, conservative management. If nothing works, you can think of uh, shoulder arthroplasty, total or reverse, depending on the condition. So the key take home message, when you approach a patient with a stiff shoulder that's not mobile, immediately think of the age of the patient, what category they come under, what they're likely to come under. If there is history of trauma, think of uh, fractures or missed fracture dislocations or soft tissue injuries like traumatic cuff tears that have led on to a secondary stiff shoulder. Okay. And if it is an insidious onset in a middle-aged patient or elderly patient, think of frozen shoulders or osteoarthritis. One needs to be aware though, sometimes a patient can come in with a history of epilepsy, no known knowledge, they can have a nocturnal fit and then wake up with a stiff shoulder, goes to the GP or the doctor who says, oh, you've not had trauma, it should be just soft tissue, go away, come back. And then they come back to you persistently with reduced movements in the shoulder, even after six or eight weeks or two or three months, and there is lack of improvement, think of a traumatic dislocation, really. So even though there is no classical history of trauma, because of the epilepsy, they could have a nocturnal fit and have a locked posterior dislocation. So a patient who doesn't respond to observation in the first few weeks, think of either a missed posterior dislocation or something related to the soft tissue, like a traumatic cuff tear. Things that you should not be missing are tumors, and uh, subclinical infection. If it's a classical or a gross infection, you will know if it's a hot, swollen, painful shoulder, patient being unwell, it's unlikely you'll miss a, an infection. And it's unlikely you'll get a case like that in the exam as well, who's got a red, hot, swollen shoulder, because it's too painful to examine. It's not the right case to have in an exam. And there are some miscellaneous causes like radiation-induced stiffness. So in the history, you need to ask about if there's anything else that's happened. and very, very rarely you can, I mean, it will be obvious when you see a patient with a stiff shoulder who's had a shoulder fusion, you'll have a big scar and the patient will give history of a fusion of the shoulder following conditions like a brachial plexus injury or a uh, missed posterior dislocation or a, a patient with highly unstable shoulder who was young and not responded to conservative management or surgical treatment, then they might end up with a shoulder fusion as well. So I hope with this talk, I've, I've been able to give you an idea as to have a, having a structure or developing a structure to approach a patient with a stiff shoulder, which can, which is quite common in the exam situation you should, or in your clinical practice. And then you can work along the lines of where the primary pathology is, whether it's primary or secondary to something and what investigations do I need to do and then talk about the management of the patient. So uh, that is pretty much it. What I have intended to do, as I highlighted at the beginning, is take up common exam scenarios that you're likely to encounter and develop an algorithm or a methodology to reach the diagnosis, confidently discuss about the management so that it can get you across the finish line. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask. I've 
put in my email there. I'm more than happy to uh, answer those queries. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. That was a very exciting lecture. I'm sure all the viewers would have enjoyed that. And let's wait for a minute so that we can answer their queries. Yeah, sure. But since it's our first lecture and people are just getting aware of it, I'm not expecting many lectures, many questions, I mean. Sure. So this becomes a strong archive and they can ask us anytime later as well and we'll be happy to oh, yeah. reciprocate. Okay, so this by this we'll end the first webinar on FRCS teaching and tomorrow we may have one more at approximately the same time. And I'm sure Dr. Santosh would come back to us again as he's a very important faculty for the FRCS exam. It's good that we have more lectures from his side. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Santosh, very much. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll end the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much.